Hey everybody, Lisa Great here with the Apostolic Resource Center. I'm so glad you could join us again this morning. I wanted to share something with you today that's maybe a little bit unique to what I've done in the past, but is extremely relevant to what God is wanting to do in our current reality. I was uh, praying, I'm trying to figure out where to put this so that it's most effective, but I was praying Psalm 139 today. Um, for you that don't know, I pray a psalm a day and I just start with Psalm 1 and I just keep going over and over again every day praying a psalm. And I find that there is so much relevant information and thoughts that God has that God has towards us that he wants to reveal to us and through us as we pray the psalms. For you that don't know, the psalms are a song book that was written by various um, authors. David wrote quite a few of them. The um, sons of, their songs of ascent, which were songs for the feast time where they would ascend the hill of the Lord. And there are songs that are written by other people as well. The sons of Korah, they were uh, temple servants. They wrote some songs. So as I was praying Psalm 139 today, I just want to encourage you with this and maybe encourage you to start considering praying a psalm a day. I find that we are able to enter into a dimension of the spirit that comes from partnering with the words of somebody else. Historically in the church, they've had song books, prayer books, um, different things where they have written about and talked about repeating um, what other people have prayed or said. I mean, think about the Lord's prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sins against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Well, you can just recite that. But if you really pray that, and really take each line as a prayer, it becomes a whole nother experience. And then you actually engage with that prayer and, and partner with Jesus and the disciples in that prayer that he taught them to pray in Matthew 6. And it takes you to a whole nother level of understanding of what was being identified in that prayer. And that is what happens in the Psalms. And so today I just wanted to walk you through Psalm 139 and the way I pray it because I prayed it today and I felt like it would be really encouraging to people. And so I just want to share some things out of this Psalm that the Lord showed me today and kind of share with you how I pray it. So in case you want to start the practice of praying the Psalms, you would have a bit of a idea of how that happens in case you're a little bit new to what does it mean to pray the Psalms or to partner with the psalmist in prayer. So it begins by saying, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thoughts from afar. Well, right there, that just immediately says, into me you see. This is a psalm of intimacy. Into me, Lord, you see. Now remember, this is you in your private prayer closet just you and Jesus, and, and to be able to acknowledge and to recognize, oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You see, we say Christ in me, the hope of glory. We say that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which are New Testament concepts. So when you read Psalm 139 verse 1, you have searched me and you've known me. Do you realize that he doesn't search you from outside of you? This is not like you're getting patted down by a police officer and he's doing a search of you. This is the God of heaven and earth that lives inside of you and he searches every aspect of who you are internally. He's not judging you. He's not criticizing you. He's not doing some kind of a um, philosophical search of you. He's doing an intimate knowing internally attitudes, motives, ideas, thoughts, dreams, desires, goals, plans, everything that goes on inside of you. He's fully aware of you. Do you realize, like I tell my son, and maybe you've told your kids this, I'm like, Joel, I know you better than you know yourself. Because I have done an intimate search of who he is. I observe 
his acts, his ways, his thoughts. I observe him from the outside. But we have a God that knows us even better than I know my son. Then your husband may know you or your wife may know you. We have a God that doesn't know us from outside in. We have a God that knows us from the inside. That's why intimacy is in to me you see. And he says, you. so the psalmist is acknowledging God, you live within me. You see everything about me. And he said, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and you even know when I rise up. Everything about me you know. He says, you understand my thoughts from afar. You've ever felt like a thought comes in and you're like, where did that come from? The Lord knows every thought you have from afar. He, it says, you scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. As I was praying this today, I realized I'm like, you know all of my patterns. You know every one of my behavior patterns. You know every one of my ways. You know all of my modes of operation. You know every one of my going out and my coming in. You are fully aware of everything I do. So think of it as a quantum computer. The algorithms in Google, when you type something in the search bar and it pops up all the things related to that which you typed, that's because of algorithms. It's following your patterns. That's why the computer makes suggestions to you about what you might like to buy, what you might like to see, what you might like to hear. The computer is, is guessing what is of interest to you based on that input which you have put into it. But you see, the computer can only guess based on input you give it. God knows exactly how you think, how you feel, how you operate, how you behave, how you react. He knows everything about you. And he loves you. <laughs> and he is familiar with you. It says, even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, Lord you know it all. You have enclosed me in behind, oh, your backside behind, and before you have laid your hand upon me. Behind, before, and upon. That means you are completely wrapped around by the presence of God. He knows you internally, and he's completely surrounded you externally. That, my friends is an intimate knowing of you. The God we serve is not a God that is distant. He's not a God that is far away. He is a God that knows us intimately. He knows everything about us. And the psalmist says, such knowledge <laughs> is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot contain it. Do you realize that God knows things about you that you don't even know about yourself? The God that you serve, Yahweh, Yeshua, the Holy Spirit knows you better than you even know yourself. This, my friend, is not to scare you. This is not to make you want to hide. This is to make you want to let your guard down. He already knows you. He already experiences you. He already understands everything about you. But you know what? When we put a guard up and say, um, we don't want God to know us. We don't want God to be that intimately acquainted with us. Guess what? When we conceal ourselves or hide ourselves from God, it's not just for us to say, God, we want to know you, but we don't want to let our guard down and really allow God to know us. You see, he already knows us. He already understands everything about us. But you know what he wants? And this is what I realized today. He wants us not only for him, us to know that he knows us like that. He wants us to want him to know us like that. When we want him to know us like that, when we get into worship with hands raised, 
with eyes wide open, with a heart that's completely aware that he knows us like that, he actually answers our cry that says, I want to know you because we are letting down our guard and letting him know us. Have you ever been in a relationship where you feel like you give more than you receive? Or where you're in a relationship where you feel like you're more open to them than they are to you? Do you realize that you actually, when you recognize that, you no longer open yourself up anymore to them because you realize they're not equally opening up to you? And may I encourage you that the more you open yourself up to God, who already knows you completely, I just told you he knows you intimately, completely, and totally. But when you are willing to let your guard down in worship, when you are willing to let your guard down in prayer, when you are willing to let your guard down before your God, do you realize that he, he unveils a measure of who he is that is more than you knew before? That's why it says, to him who much has been given, much is required. So when, when we give more of ourselves to God, God is required to give more of himself to us. And when God gives more of himself to us, we are required to give more of ourselves to him because he wants us to be a perfect match. So let's just use percentages. This isn't accurate when it comes to spiritual things, but let's just use it as an example. If I only open up 15% of who I am to God and I hide 85% of myself, then God only opens up a measure of who he is to me. But the more I open up to him, the more he opens up to me, which makes me open up more of me to him, which makes him open up more of him to me. But here's the coolest thing. God started this whole process. God said, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. So because God loved me first, first John says, that's why I love God. So the more that God reveals his love to me, the more I reveal my love to God. But if I ever stop responding to God in love, responding to God in intimacy, responding to this God that knows me so well, then, then there will be a measure of halting how much more he reveals of himself to me. So have you ever wondered why some people know God better than others? It's not because God's not able to be known in the same measure to everybody. It's because of the measure with which you use it, the Bible says it shall be measured back to you. That means the more I realize God knows me intimately, internally, externally, his, he hems me in behind and before and his hand is upon me, plus he lives within me. So into me he sees. This knowledge is too wonderful for me. But that knowledge is revealed to me so that I can open up more of me to him. And the measure to which I respond to that which I've already been revealed, the more he will give and the more I will respond. So the reason some people know him more than you do is not because you can't know him any more than you already do. It comes down to the measure with which you're willing in a, a location that is between you and God. And you let down your guard and you let down your walls and you and he commune in a measure of intimacy that you've never known before. And out of that relationship with him, you actually engage in a closer relationship with other people. Because they begin to see the intimacy you have with God and they want that kind of relationship with you. And it becomes this, this love God, love people, love people, love God. And that's why it says such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high for me to uh, attain it. And then he goes on in verse 7 and he talks about where can I go from you? Where can I flee? If I go here or I go there or I make my bed here or I make my bed there, if I'm the wings of the dawn or in the remotest part of the sea, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're in the darkest depths of depression or you're in the greatest awakening of your life, it doesn't matter because the darkness and the light are the same to God. 
He doesn't go, he doesn't leave you because you're struggling. He doesn't leave you because you're manifesting. He doesn't leave you because you're in one state or in a different state. He doesn't, he doesn't move away from you because you're in one title or, a, or no title. He doesn't care if you're a mom or if you're single. He doesn't care if you're married or if you're divorced. No matter where you find yourself, he's always with you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. You know, sometimes we feel like I got to be in the right place, the right church, the right city, the right town, the right, the right, the right. And we get so concerned and, and there's an element of obedience. God wants you in certain places, certain locations, certain destinations, but just because you're single and not married, that doesn't mean God is, is for you or against you. God is always with you, no matter where you may be, whether you're in poverty or prosperity. That's why it says, remember the Lord, your God, Deuteronomy 8, 18, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. He doesn't forget you because you're rich or because you're poor. Your financial status is irrelevant to God. He's in the poverty and he's in the prosperity. He's in the darkness and he's in the light. He's in the highest heights and he's in the lowest depths. That's what the psalmist is telling us. He's always with you. Don't ever separate from him. He's never separating himself from you. So I want you to be encouraged. That's why it says, for you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And my soul knows it full well. No matter where you may be, in life or in death, in depression or in awakening, in singleness or in marriage, in children or in barrenness, God is the same. He is with you in every season of your soul. I want you to be encouraged today, my friends. As you pray the Psalms, you enter into an understanding of God that you would have not known before. And it allows you to realize that he is forever with you. And I can be as close to him as I want to be, or I can be as far away from him as I want to be. I'm the one that puts up a guard, not him. But the measure to which I engage with him is to the measure with which he will engage with me. And when we have this perfect match of engagement, of give and take, of receive and respond, we will find our relationship with the Lord becomes an ebb and flow. And whether I'm going through a battle or whether I'm in a victory, he's with me in both locations. Whether I'm living in this city or that city, he is forever with me. He never leaves you and he never forsakes you. And praying Psalm 139 just solidified, established, engaged my heart in a fresh new way this morning. And I wanted to share it with you because I want that for you. You can hear me say it and it can encourage you. But if you do it yourself, it'll establish you. I want you to be established that is how we encourage ourselves in the Lord, by being established in his word, by learning to pray the Psalms. I thank you so much for listening today. My name is Lisa Great. I'm the president and founder of the Apostolic Resource Center. If you'd like to donate to the Apostolic Resource Center, we'd love to have you join us and partner with us. We are doing some joint ventures with some other ministries. We are partnering with Hope You See Nashville here. We are establishing what God is building with the Apostolic Resource Center. You can join us by going to www.apostolicresourcecenter.org and you can click the donate button. We really appreciate you. We hope you have a great day and that God establishes you in his word by praying the Psalms. God bless you.